So anyway, these are my credentials for for as a, in a board culture. So I've done a lot of tree work. That's how I made my money. But and that there was my business, Tree Wolf, uh, named after a book called The Sea Wolf about a Danish captain. So uh, this is a picture of me having fun because I'm going to talk about other fun fun ways of getting using tree climbing to achieve something. Uh, okay, now it's on YouTube. I see how it works. Yeah. Uh, now they won't. Mm. Next. Okay. Uh, in the Oakland Hills, where we're going to have our camp out this weekend is right in the native redwood habitat. But the original redwoods, they were very big, were cut down starting in the 1850s. So there's only one that's an old growth. Everything else is second growth or even third growth. This particular tree is right near where we're camping. This is about 500 years old and this is our only surviving tree. So, so we like that one. And um, I went ahead and climbed it and measured it. So it's 117 feet or it was a few years ago. Uh, uh, and it's got a triple trunk. It's not very big and not very old as redwood goes. The, the tallest redwood is 380 feet, is also the tallest known tree in the world, which is up north of here, up in, in Humboldt County. Really? Yeah. So, there aren't like taller trees in like Australia or perhaps nope. Borneo? No? No? Nope. Nope. Uh, there, 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 there were uh, going okay. back 100 years, uh, but they were taller redwoods also, but there were so right. many ones cut down. Right. But May I ask a question one, or is it too soon? No. Please. <laughs> yes. Yes. How do you go about measuring a tree? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, you, uh, you, you the the, uh, the best, the most precise way is old fashioned. You drop a tape measure. So here, uh, I am holding a a, a three hundred foot tape measure at the top. My friend is holding the bottom at the base of the tree, and we make sure it's tight. And that's how we read it. So there are there are other ways you can uh, you can do it from the ground with what's called a range finder with a laser range finder you can take a reading that's not as, as exact so if you really want to know you you can just climb it with a tape measure right um, there are also like other kind of devices like a clinometer but clinometer that's that's your old school forestry yeah. citing it uh, and and one problem with a clinometer and a laser range finder is uh, it's very hard to know from the ground that you are siding the top of the tree. You, yeah. at the point you're siding is the top. Now, yeah. some trees, like this tree here, I could actually reach the very top. Some other trees I measured, the top is so skinny that I cannot get up there myself. But then I, I raise the tape measure on a uh, fiberglass pole and get a reading that way. Um, so and the, the tallest. Uh, Eric, you said the tallest was how tall? 380 feet. So that's a, that's, so that's wow. a redwood, right? A redwood yeah, we're talking yes. about. Yes. So, yeah, that's 380. Does he have a name? Does he have Hypericum. a name? Hypericum. Oh, yeah, Hypericum. Yeah. Okay. It's 150 meters. I think once I climbed one that's um we kind of estimate it to be 95 meters so 20 meters shorter so that's like 60 feet shorter it was definitely like in a nice grove and yeah, i mean yeah. we, we kind of like estimated by like the number of ropes we used and like our um tag lines we right. dropped several times yeah, yeah. So it was more estimated than eric how tall was the one that we climbed off site um when we did the redwoods uh, a couple years ago, we estimated it about 240 feet, I think, but not we did not measure it with a tape or anything. But that was the the best we came up with, same as you using the the, uh, the length of our ropes and stuff. Okay, what was the name of that one? Do you remember? We, uh, we called it the Reynolds tree. Reynolds, yeah. that's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the tallest uh, hardwood or broadleaf trees is another story. And uh, the tallest were until recently uh, considered the, uh, the, the mountain ass, Eucalyptus regnans in Australia. 
uh, but they found some taller flowering trees in uh, mm -hmm. Borneo right. recently. And I think uh, one of the people who was who was interviewed by Vicky in, on Instagram, he was part of doing that project in Borneo to measure the really tall trees. Right. Um, yeah, so I think there was a, a net, net geo story about that in the National Geographic in, uh -huh. a year ago, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, so this is the East Bay. This is now uh, all developed. This is old city. This is Oakland. But this is what it looked like before the gold rush, before California became a part of the United States. This was still part of Mexico. So they would they would have huge yeah. land grants and they would run cattle there. So this was the El Rancho de San Antonio, a family called the Peraltas had it. It's another family out here, the Maracas, they had this. Between them, they had what they called Los Palos Colorados, which were huge redwoods. And then there's, a, there's some of them there, and this white campsite is right in there. Um, nice. How many people are going camping with you? I don't know. <laughs> it's How many like people? That. <laughs> okay. How many people are going camping in Florida? <laughs> Maybe they do not. So far, four. Okay. Yeah. So far. I, 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 you know, Eric I have a group of climbers that I invite for climbing events and I, I tell them where and when and I, I, I always end with RSVP. They don't, I don't hear a word. And then I, you know, some of them show up and some of them don't. So that's uh, funny. Some of them are going to say they're going to be there. So we're going to have some people for sure. Right. Uh, I, I trust me. I, I understand how you feel, Eric. <laughs> right. The way society works these days with, yeah. um, people being distracted by social media and all this stuff, like it's impossible to get people to commit. Communication is so difficult. Yeah. Is, is that why you think it is just in general, even without COVID? Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's societal. I think it's the way things are functioning and response. I could get like, like my little soapbox out, but I know you guys are trying to do a thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just like, I mean, I'm, I'm curious. It's like like what I referred to before that I have a hard time reading books. And sometimes like, why is this? Do I really have less time? Or the time just the basically goes to Attention spans are short. Yeah. yeah. It's like, uh, that's the thing. And, and the, and the uh, what used to be considered common courtesy, like respond. Like you're invited, mm -hmm. you respond. Yeah, I mean, it used to be people send a letter, you know, that's, that's the history. Now they don't even re reply in an email. And the right. thing is, it's taught to us socially that it's acceptable because essentially what's going on is whatever is more entertaining, right? So people are like, oh, maybe if nothing better comes along and that's why they never right, commit. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. But they also miss out on life in that way, right? Yeah, but they, don't, they, don't, they don't understand that. So we have a, a degrading quality of life and people right. are miserable and they don't understand why. <laughs> I, I think you should give a little talk about that the next time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I, I that's true. It's, educate, uh, educate us like how we can make the most of like our oh. life and nature in our life. Rosa is, an, Rosa is an old soul in a young body. Uh -huh. <laughs> is that Nina? Oh my goodness. Oh, she being so good. Okay. Again, like five minutes of petting her. So, so these are trees, as, as we talked about, trees from the American West Coast that are now the tallest trees and they are the lumber trees in Denmark, Holland, and England. Because it's a similar climate. It's, it's mild and, uh, and wet, like in Northern California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia. So we get the Douglas fir is popular. It's really good for construction. Sitka spruce also. Um, and this guy here is had a, had a very interesting life. He he traveled in uh, on the West Coast before, way before he was part of the United States, and collected seeds, sent it back to to Holland, and then went to Hawaii. And and there, the story is a little bit unclear. Either somebody killed him for his money, or he fell in a pit and got killed by a bull. But anyway, his life was short and ended in Hawaii. <laughs> mm. yeah. Not a bad, not a bad place. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just as we have American trees in Europe, uh, right here in California, we have non-native trees, eucalyptus. And in the Bay Area, we have a lot of blue gums, eucalyptus globulus. They like, they like the climate and they, they get dense and they are controversial. They can be a fire hazard and they, 
and they, uh, by some people, think that they are crowding out natives and not providing any habitat. So it all depends how they are maintained. Um, but if I, could, I may, uh, if I may add, uh, Eric, I absolutely loved uh, climbing that eucalyptus with you. I love the smell of it. Right. Yeah, I love the smell. It's like camphor, that uh, very uh, aromatic. Yeah. I, I, do, I think, I'm not sure if you mentioned it this time, but when you said like eucalyptus uh, was kind of being planted because people thought it had all sorts of like medicinal qualities and I don't know what. Yeah. Um, so during COVID in uh, Argentina, all of a sudden, like this year, around March this year, people started like, making these like brews of like eucalyptus like definitely like a tea but like brewed forever it was like very thick and they would like take that because they like at least in my province like everyone believed like when you got when you get covid at least you won't die if you have like eucalyptus mm. like this brew of eucalyptus right. and so people like uh, started asking me like and also my assistants they started joking like maybe we should climb like all the eucalyptus at like the Estancia and just like collect everything and make lots of money you know because um the the ranch basically where I work like there's this, this lane with like eucalyptus trees so they've also been planted in like Argentina and so we kind of like joked about it a little bit but I mean yeah, you, it also made like its way into my life because I live with someone else. And then all of a sudden there were like these bottles of like eucalyptus extracts, you know, right. so in the fridge, yeah. Well, let yeah. me tell you before, when I first started doing tree work, I didn't have a chipper. So what I would do, oh. I would load the branches in my truck and cut down, like get in the back of the truck and cut it down. And to fit in as much as possible, I would cut them like one way and then the other way and then diagonally like a tic-tac-toe. And right. when you're doing that, you're breathing in, you're, you're breathing in, you get a very heavy concentration of eucalyptus oil and it, it really clears out the sinuses. Right. Yeah, I'm not saying it, it, it doesn't help. I'm, you know, it's just, it was really funny that it was like, all of a sudden, like everyone was like trying to get eucalyptus and asking me about it. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. No, and that would be great if it, uh, if it would cure COVID. But uh, yeah, yeah. It, it was... At this time, uh, about 120 years ago, when they started planting a lot in California, some people say they will, it will cure malaria. You, know, mm, so you nice. just go through the eucalyptus spores and breathe it in and, and you get rid of the malaria. And so, yeah, there's a lot of mythology about that. Yeah. If I can ask you a question you might not know about, I was recently, uh, recently, I don't know, a month or so ago, reading an article that they're thinking about doing controlled burning in California like they do in Florida. And I thought it was kind of surprising that they didn't already. Is that true? Uh, they do, but not probably not as much as they need to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, the native Californians used to do controlled burns and manage the forest by burning it. And then uh, fires were suppressed. And then the people have reason over the last few decades, they really understand that that, uh, you know, controlled burning is part of the of natural cycle and it reduces the fire hazard and it's healthy for the forest. But there's also uh, resistance to doing it. And there's, a, you know, people are very afraid of, uh, of fire if it's near near cities and they don't like the smoke. So, but it's good. It's ongoing. It's a, it's kind of limited. It probably should be more than it really is. Yeah. We, so I actually, Rose, I actually live in Colorado. So we have similar issues. Uh, we also have fires like every summer and also because there's too much fuel because people don't do, or people didn't like burn like for a very long time. And now there are prescribed burns, but yeah, generally speaking, um, even if people are not afraid of the fire or even a prescribed burn or like afraid of their houses, they, they just think it's like sad, like sad that we're like killing the trees, you know, they, uh, sometimes it's just that where they're just like we don't want the trees to go it's like but these trees and this grass all this fuel is gonna like you know destroy your home in the in the end if you don't get rid of it right. but well, I think they need to be better informed right because for the most part it's not killing like old growth it actually helps it and stuff right it Often, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah it it depends a little bit because some of these forests are so dense they would have never been that dense if like the ecosystem would have been, uh, you know, natural, still in its natural state. 
So there is like a lot more fuel, like the, the trees are far closer to like, in my case, like Boulder than they have, have ever been in the past, basically. Um, so that like it will like, in essence, you, you do have to change the landscape. And often people have trouble with like, you know, like I said in the Netherlands, like what I had as well, like you don't want the landscape to change. Like that's what it is. Like it's your, that's what you got used to. I think that's often difficult to explain. Like, you know, it's okay to have a different landscape sometimes if that brings it back to the natural state and protects your house. But yeah. I work in insurance, which, you know, oh. I'm not exactly thrilled about. But the thing is, is that, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the fires all the time. So um, mm -hmm. it seems that at, at some point they would come to realize the, the reality of the necessity of it. Because, I mean, California is on fire, like, all the oh, time. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> It's crazy. It's it's bad. I mean, and last year was bad, but this year is is you know, this year to date is is worse right. or whatever. Yeah. You know, and um, so yeah. yeah, that's that's a big issue. It really is. You know, and that's so. So how about Florida though? Because you do get the summer rain. It, summer. Does it? Do you still get the big forest fires. It hmm. depends if you're having an, an El Nino or La Nina, because we don't always have hurricanes. Sometimes we have a dry summer and um, uh, you'll see when you come to my property, uh, you know, depending on how wet it is, when people come in here and they see the swamp and they see the water level coming like literally 20 feet from my house, it's hard for them to imagine that it can be 100% dry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm no water at all including the creek itself being completely dry and it's about 20 feet deep and being like dry that you can walk on the creek mm. and we do fluctuate we go all the way from that to wet and when it is that dry then the fire hazard is off the roof mm. because basically what we have is a bog uh, the years of the cypress needles falling and creating basically um, just feet and of just uh, it's a it's a bog and right. the fire can travel underground and shoot in different directions. So basically, you know, if I'm not flooding, I'm burning, and the swamp. Right notorious for burning and when they burn they burn right so why do you live there <laughs> i i absolutely love wetlands okay <laughs> where life starts in fresh water it's it's sort of like living in the mangroves if you're in the oh you know in the in the salt water system right. being in a wetland is really where life is it's uh -huh. i can yeah. see that <laughs> Plus, um, you know, Florida, we don't really get seasonal changes in Florida. It's usually just kind of summer and dry and then you get the spring and lots of flowers and, you know, you just, you know, we don't really have a winter per se, mm. but if you live in a swamp, you do feel the winter because I have 11 acres and about, I would say eight of those acres are a cypress forest. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a new cypress forest. The trees are very young, 60, 70 years old, but they completely lose their leaves during the winter. I mean, their needles. And, right. and the Florida uh, maple, the swamp maple, which does turn red and yellow, mm -hmm. it also loses its leaves. So if you live in a swamp in Florida, you truly do feel the season changes which you don't in the other parts of Florida. Mm. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. So if you're kind of into seasonal changes, do not live like in the, in the Miami area. I just go where Nadia is. <laughs> <laughs> go to the swamp. It's a, it's a different beauty. Right. Know? Right, well, I can see that. It, I'm looking forward to visiting. Mm. I like the uh, I like the swamps in Louisiana when I was down there. It's, 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 it's a lot yeah. of life going on. Yukes. So this is me. I had my tree service. I'm there 30 some years. 
between those two pictures, there's always eucalyptus that need to be cut down because they are all around the houses and they get big. And if I just wanted to make money and not worry about anything else, I would cut eucalyptus every day of my life. I don't know if it's my settings, but I can't see the picture more to the left. Uh, huh. I, I do see everything. Hmm. There are two pictures. Yeah. On the left, you definitely look like a Viking. Yeah. <laughs> right. Those are more, more hairy days. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll talk about a couple of other species we have here. These are native to uh, the Monterey area, south of San Francisco. They are not native to my area, but there's a lot of them around here. Monterey pines and cypresses. They are both native to a very, very limited range. And this place here, Point Lopez, where we visited to when we had our Redwood Rendezvous, is the only place where the two of them are native together. But they have both been planted around the world, and the Monterey pines are planted as lumber species in New Zealand and Australia, and they are planted as as uh, both planted as ornamental also around the world. And the the Monterey pines, when they're planted here in the Oakland Berkeley area, they grow fast, they get big, but they have a limited lifespan, and then they fall apart, they fall on houses, and or they develop diseases. So there's also a lot of money there cutting pine. So I did a lot of that. Sometimes like in this one picture, I have to cut them in tiny little slices and throw them out in a little spot. And sometimes there's a little room to work and I can drop it in a big top like that, which is more fun. So that's a hairy picture of me too also. And uh, you know, I wasn't big on the safety like helmet and I had, I had like a manila three strand rope that was there was one strand was broken, you know, but it all worked out. <laughs> <laughs> so how many strands like oh this is always something i know people have told me this and i think always like err on the safe side or like i don't i just don't climb enough so I'm, like my ropes at some point i have to throw out because they're old but they're not broken right right and so way, our, our how climbing many, ropes are either 12 16 or 24 strands. right so how many strands do you break before you throw it out you think like it's not safe anymore you cut it off that part okay uh I, I, I like to say two or more close to each other. Okay. But, but, but if there if they is one here and one like a foot away, you're okay. Kind of like that. Right. But okay. if you have a three, if you have a three strand rope. Yeah, no. Have there, which is, this is also Manila. This is before synthetics. Right. So I know I, I one strand is hanging down. So I know I lost 30% right there. Right. <laughs> yeah i would not climb on that i always think like if one or perhaps i can need two kind of strands are gone on my 24 strand ropes and i should be okay you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's what i normally tell people but yeah um, so anyway i had this tree service here for many many years and uh, you know i kept it small i had a dump truck a chip or a bunch of chainsaws and stuff and i had a, one or two crews working and it was pretty good it was fun and we liked what we were doing and then uh it was a good living, but then I got really interested in uh, canopy research. And uh, did, like we talked about, Nalini Natkani was one of the pioneers. She planted trees in a lot of trees in the Pont Monteverde in Costa Rica. And she studied the soil mats and the epiphytes and the mosses. And she came to a, a conference in 2006 of the annual conference of the American Society of Consulting Operas. And she gave a talk and I hung out with her and talked about it. So, you know, I was inspired by her stories. And I read this book also that came out. This is the first guy that really, a, a biologist that climbed trees to study what was up there in the, uh, in the canopy, Don Perry. And I didn't meet him then, but I met him many years later. And I had him as my keynote speaker at my Costa Rica rendezvous. So before the, the climbing and the modern climbing equipment, People would do things like use a balloon, have to build towers, cranes, send up a, a, a big smoke of poison and put out a net and study everything that fall down. So, uh, oh God, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah I know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's why, and, that, and that's why when we uh, we are kind of at a cutting edge, that's why we are in demand. Mm -hmm. We have the equipment and the skill, and a lot of people don't. You know, and that's why there's opportunities to to help out with research and get involved. So this is 
it's a good time. Right. Uh, so I always been fascinated with the, the Amazon. And the interesting, we talked about John Muir earlier in the other talk. And John Muir was a uh, born in Scotland. He moved to Wisconsin. He went to school. He studied botany. And then right after the Civil War, he decided he wanted to go to the Brazilian Amazon. So he walked all the way from Wisconsin to Florida, got on a boat to Cuba, and he's trying to get on a boat to go to South America. And that was his big dream. Well, things happened. And meanwhile, he got sick and he, and he didn't, he ran out of money and he ended up going to New York and he ended up going to Panama and, and he ended up in California. You know, he was like 20 years old at the time. And then he had his whole life in California, started the share club and explored the mountains. Then when he was like 73 years old, he says, now, now it's time to go. Mm -hmm. And then he went, he went to the Amazon and he, he just went by himself and explored and traveled all over in like 1911, I think it was, he went, you know, back when they had the rubber boom. So, so it's a fascinating story. So I always been fascinated by the Amazon. I went down there. I didn't really know where I was going. Uh, I went to the most remote place I can think of, which is up here, it's Horaima, it's close to Venezuela. Um. I, yeah, I bought a ticket to there and the, uh, I went to the, to the Brazilian consulate in San Francisco and, and I wanted a, a visa and they said, we want to see your ticket. And I said, well, I'm going to Boa Vista, Horaima. And they said, no, they, nobody goes there. <laughs> and I said, well, I just want to see it. And then they said, no, there's nothing there. It's not a tourist place. And they had to argue, I had to argue with them. I said, well, I just want to see it. And it's kind of funny when I, I went up there, I met some of the local uh, officials and they were asking me, I said, how can we develop adventure tourism? And how can we get people to come here and spend some money? I said, well, first you talk to your government because they say there's nothing here, nothing, right. no reason to go. <laughs> it's a fascinating area. It's like frontier. It was like, yeah. it was like, you know, cowboys and Indians and gold miners, illegal loggers, illegal gold mining. Uh, you know, smugglers, cocaine smugglers, all kinds of crazy things. And I, I went to a small little t uh, village on the border of close to Venezuela and Colombia. Uh, and you look across the valley and you're looking into Venezuela. And, uh, you know, I heard some people talking about me and I, I could kind of understand what they said. And they're saying, what is, what is with this gringo? What is he doing here? And then they said, uh, the one guy said, no, he said he came out here to climb trees. So they said, no, no, there's nobody. That doesn't make sense. So they said, they said, okay, either he's with the CIA or he's a smuggler. There's something else going on here. <laughs> no, no, I want to climb some trees. So, <laughs> so did you end up like taking groups or whatever to Venezuela? Or you just no, I did not. This was just I ended up doing like canopy research in the in the Brazilian um, Amazon. So the group travels I started doing in Costa Rica. Right. Okay. And I keep going back there because uh, yeah, so many places, and I know it so well. But, yeah, I might do some future groups, other places. Okay. Uh, right. right now, Venezuela. I was in a in a in a little town on right on the border there, and people go back and forth between Venezuela and Brazil all the time. I went in there, and now what I hear from people, you know, when I was there, the people that I met, uh, they were very poor. They didn't have much. Now some of them have, you know, they have computers. They get on Facebook, so. I hear from them and they're saying it's it's bad. Venezuela is real bad. There's a lot of of people fleeing Venezuela coming into Brazil because there's Venezuela is yeah. there's nothing nothing to do. There's very little food. Eric, yeah. what year did you go there? Uh 2006. So not that long ago, actually. No. Yeah. Not that long ago. So I, I roamed around up here in Horaima. I went to Venezuela, I went into Guiana. And then I went down into down here in Mato Grosso, mm. another part of the Amazon, because I hooked up with some uh, canopy projects. I went into Manaus, I went up the Rio Negro, I mean, a lot of places. So I definitely want to go back there. Nice. But this is one project. This is just by talking to people. This is Embrapa, is the Brazilian Agriculture and Forestry Department. And they want to study these trees that are called Copaiba. So they wanted to grow some seedlings to study and they needed the seeds. Well, by the time the seeds fall, they already been eating. So, you know, I, I went out with them and another local climber and we climbed the trees and collected seeds for them. Uh, so here is my little team. This guy here uh, was the other climber. 
and uh, I had my little big shot head, and they loved that. They were very impressed, and we put that on a uh, on a stick, and it said lions that way, and we collected these seeds. And this is one of the products of the from these seeds uh, from the trees. They tap it just like you tap a sugar maple, and they and they get this oil that's good for a lot of things. It's it's medicinal, but it's also uh, good for for industrial purposes. So they want to try to develop that, go for more of these trees. That way you can you can make some money from the forest you, you, rather than burning it and 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 having cattle. So I, I that's really smart to just take the head of the big shot with you. Never thought of that. Right? Like, yeah, yeah. There's always a uh, stick. But right. now recently I've had uh, I had the short poles I made with a, with a lighter blue stick. So I do carry sticks. Right. Uh, so this is a river in the in the Mato Grosso, also in the Amazon, Rio Cristalina. And uh, I went there with some people to do like a botanical inventory to study what's there. Uh, and this is me climbing a tree. And this is the uh, the botanist taking the, I would collect the uh, seeds, flowers, leaves from the canopy, send them down and we would press them at night to have samples for identification and send them to an herbarium in Manaus. And uh, we went to this one resort way up a river where they had built a, a tower for observation of life in the canopy. And uh, this is a little bit something about the study from the Q, it was sponsored by the Q Gardens in London. And this is a team, these are the botanists and these are local guides that they knew their way around the forest because it is easy to get lost for sure. Mm -hmm. This tower, there is a, a button is Denise at the top of the tower. So this was above the, uh, the canopy and they would have it so people could visit. They could go up there and see the birds and the monkeys. Then there was a tree right next to the tower that started leaning towards it and it had some big shelf mushrooms growing at the base. It was obviously a rotten tree, which also proved later we cut it down. That was uh, it's totally rotten in the core, but uh, I ended up cutting it down for them because this is what I do. But actually, by the time I went to that place, I saw it. I already had a ticket going home and I didn't have my, my equipment to do that type of work. So then they sent me an email and say, oh, this tree is leaning more. It's like, hey, hitting right for the tower. So I said, okay, all right, I'll come down. So I, I flew all the way down to Sao Paulo. I got another flight to this town called Coitiba. I, I spent like 14 hours on a bus. I spent 10 hours on a boat. I finally get up there and I climb the tree and cut it down. And that was like a major trip. It's funny because people laugh at me because sometimes I'm like, people want me to cut down a tree in, in, in Danville, which is 30 miles from Berkeley. I said, man, it's too far. I only work in Berkeley. But, um, <laughs> no, go to the Amazon. <laughs> you know, yeah, but that was just an adventure. And, and uh, so I'm wearing a head net here because when I looked up, there was a big wasp nest in that tree, in the tree next to it, and the branches were entangled. So I was afraid to disturb the, the wasp and they would come at me. Uh, then as I removed the branches uh, towards that nest and they didn't come at me, I took it off. But that net is really useful and it's, uh, it's come in useful a few times because at least even if you're gonna get stung, at least then they won't get your eyes, you'll be able to see what you're doing, you can come down. Right. But Eric, your your forearms are um, exposed. Yeah. You have gloves, but they can still get your arms. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, my man, they can get me to the shirt. That's a light shirt. Okay. You know? I mean, it's it's. Uh, I just want I just want my eyes. You know, in the worst case scenario, if I get swamped, so I can see to come down. Okay. Yeah, you know, the worst experience. I got stung a couple times with by wasps, but not never like really a full. Uh, uh, attack but the worst experience i had was the bullet ants they got me pretty good they were a pretty pretty painful sting oh uh, yeah yeah i think at one of those in like uh, in it's cyber actually in costa rica or at least oh, there wow. were like a bunch of really large ants that were coming from uh, the cyber and i think i just tied into like my second line and they were just like coming oh. they were all like using my climbing line to like get to me oh yeah and yeah like, i don't know but <laughs> yeah know I made a very quick decision. All of a sudden, I was flying to the other side of my second line, you know. Yeah. But and like then I was, I was like kind of on my second line. I was like, whoa, that was a really fast decision. Like, how did you know you were safe to like go, you know, to just take off and away from the ends? But yeah, there were like 
starting to get all over me. They're not fun. Oh, they will come at you. And they, they, yeah. they really got me in this place here. It's called a place called Tirambina on the eastern slope of Costa Rica. And we did some research about this little poison dart frog. It's called the blue gene frog, little blue legs. And uh, I, I was watching a bullet ant walk up the trunk. And, and, and it was pretty cool. So I took a little video of it. And I didn't realize that they were, there was like a bed of soil, right? Where they were, a lot of them were inside where they stepped on and then they came at me. So they got me pretty good. And uh, I took some Benadryl and slipped for four hours and I was okay again, but it sure hurt. Wow. But this is an experiment we did down here with this blue jean frog. It has a, uh, a life cycle where it will put its tadpoles inside the central ponds in Bromeliads. So uh, we made this little contraption and we want to see if it would also use it. See, we've got these strips of plastic in there just so if it gets in there, it can climb out. Um, they didn't use it, but but there was still a useful experiment because we had a bunch of uh, microscopy students that came down to study microscopy. So, so after these have been up uh, in the canopy for a long time, they were covered all kinds of stuff. And each one was a different color and each one had a different composition of microorganism. So they would take that in you know, a water out of there and look at it in the microscope and study what was there. Nice. And this is the blue jean frog sitting there down by my canopy anchor. And, uh, you know, they, you see them, I saw them a lot on the ground, but I couldn't find them in the canopy. But you also hear them, they have a specific sound they make when they're mating. They're pretty cool. Uh, so then I was hired to make some uh, platforms in the canopy for the Organization of Tropical Sciences at a place called Las Cruces Research Station. And that was super interesting. You know, so we had to pretty much had to design it, carry all the material back, get it up in the trees, put it together. Um, and uh, then they used it. They actually haven't used it as much as I was hoping they would. There's been some change in management. But it's still there, it's still looking good. Here's a view, this is a big tropical oak up on a ridge top, and here's our platform and, and a uh, hammer. And, uh, what, were, uh, what were they planning on using it for? Oh, they put like instruments to measure anything, rainfall, wind speed, uh, they put motion detector cameras, and you know. So this is like, like organization of tropical science is has like three or four different field stations in Costa Rica. Yeah. And you might know it, you heard of the La Selva? Yeah. La yeah. Selva is the biggest one. So this is a lot of, of uh, universities together that have this organization. And some will make a proposal, make a plan, they'll go down there and do some research. So that's part of the network that now they had the opportunity. Uh, and of course they might not be climbers. So we did, uh, we trained some of the local like maintenance workers to be climbing guides, to be able to take them up there. Uh, I don't know how much they've done of that. There was a, last time I was there, it was actually bad timing because I was there New Year's Day. So there's nobody there. There's just one guy. I wanted to talk to, to management. And it was bad timing for another reason because we had to hike way in the forest with the gear and climb up there. And uh, most of my people were hung over. Uh, because they partied in a little town the night before. Was, I was not. I'd gone to bed early. You know, I'm getting old, but uh, it was just bad timing as all around. But but still, we right. had fun. Here is it from that day. This is getting up on the platform. So yeah. the, this is five years after we built them, and they're you know they're looking good. They're solid, and everything is fine. They're not hurting the trees. Right. Um, nice. So yeah, I want to visit there again uh, next time we go to Costa Rica, mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of this, uh, I feel like my life has, has been driven by my fantasies as a little boy. I, I read Jack London's book and all these other fantasies and I never followed, I never stayed home and, and had a career and all that, but uh, I read this book called Usko and Sun, that means the son of the, uh, of the jungle. And this is about a little boy. He gets kidnapped by the orangutan and he lives with the orangutans up in the tree tops. And then, you know, when my friend, uh, he went to Borneo to work with orangutan, I'm like, I have to go. And uh, here is some big, is a big male orangutan and here's some sun bears. 
at this rehab center where we were. And uh, what what my friend James is doing, he is training uh, the wildlife workers in climbing, climbing with equipment safely because sometimes they have to climb for their rehab. And sometimes they will get baby orangutans that have been rescued from the pit trade. Well, the uh, the evil pit traders, would they would shoot the mother and take the baby and try to sell it. So now there's no mother to teach the baby to climb. And it's it needs a person to teach it to climb. And that's why we're doing the climbing. Right. Eric, what's the animal on the bottom picture that's... It's a, uh, it's a sun bear. It's the smallest bear of all the bears. It's a, it's a Borneo native bear. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. it about what, 20, 30 pounds or size of a cat or? No, uh, size of a medium large dog. Okay. Yeah. 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 And they, they were pretty aggressive. And we actually did some, uh, they had them at this, at this rehab center. And they had a big enclosure with concrete walls and the trees both inside and outside. So some of them had escaped. They would climb the tree, go on the branch and jump to another branch outside the wall and escape. So they asked us to, to prune the trees so those branches did not go over the wall. And be, meanwhile, they were, they were not very happy we were doing that. They were like snarling at us. Mm. Right. Yeah, and the other thing, like, with orangutans is that, um, like, normally, because they normally only have, like, one, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they normally raise their, like, infants for basically eight years they stay with the mother. Well, normally. Yeah. So it's not only the fact that, like, they need to climb uh, or need to learn how to climb, but if they don't learn how to climb, they don't learn how to, like, use the forest. Well, That's, like, part of the reason, like, it takes that long before they're, like, independent, like, independent, like, foragers, basically. So yeah, it's very important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, they're amazing. I've seen I've seen some in the forest. I've seen some mothers with the baby. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, I hope we get to go back there. You know, now we are waiting for the work to open up. Um, if I can ask you a question, Eric. So those platforms that you guys designed and put up there, you said you know they were there for some time and they weren't hurting the tree. So how did you suspend them in a way where the materials wouldn't degrade and it would also not cause damage? Like, is that too involved of a question? No, no, that's a very simple answer. And we took, we took uh, uh, steel cables and we, we, we cut up motorcycle tires and put this, the motorcycle tire around the trunk and the cable inside that. And then the cables are attached with uh, clamps so they can be adjusted. So with time, as as the branches and the trunk increase in diameter, you can back off the uh, the cables, and they work perfectly well. That's awesome. And there's a uh, there's a video of this whole project that shows how we how we build those canopies. It's it's on YouTube. It's called Into the Canopy on the Tree Wolf Channel. Thank you. Uh, I'll look at that. How do you know you had a channel, Eric? Oh. Like writing it down right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tree Wolf channel. I got a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And do a little like playlist from our channel to your channel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nice. So yeah, it's uh I got a little bit of this and that, tree climbing training and various stuff, you know, it's a mismatch. But anyway, so now uh, talking about some wildlife work right back here in the San Francisco Bay Area. This one area called the Altamont Pass. Is a uh, is a open space. There's a lot of open space. There's a few cities around there, and there's a lot of windmills. And unfortunately, this is also the area of the whole country where there has the highest concentration of golden eagles, because there are a lot of um, ground squirrels and rabbits and stuff that they like to eat. So the uh, there's a problem where the eagles get hurt by by the windmills and they break their wings. And we want to look at that and study it and see what can be done to minimize that. So uh, we are putting little backpacks that are satellite transmitters on the back of the eagles, and we can measure their flight patterns. And that way, the idea is to see what kind of windmills, where to situate them, and things like that for better planning for the future. And a lot of these windmills, 
were built about 30 years ago. A lot of them have uh, a lot of them have 25 or 30 or 35 year leases with the land, and those leases are coming up for renewal. So we want to influence that process. We want to say, okay, please don't renew it. Or if you're going to put up windmill, this is the best kind. This is the best place to put it to minimize these these type of accidents. And uh, so here are the windmills, and there's a there's a I'm up in a tall blue gum eucalyptus, which which the eagles like to nest in. Those are the tallest trees around. They also nest in these blue oaks. This is typical California blue oak woodland. Here is my biologist friend climbing, and I'm watching him. And, and uh, so here is a, uh, a baby eagle, not ready to fly yet. This is about their size. They get, they get pretty big before they fledge. And that is the time I have to get them because they have to be big enough that I can put a backpack with a transmitter on them which is like a little box of solar panel on, you know, but if they're too big, if they're ready to fledge, as soon as they see me climbing the tree and coming up there, then they just jump and take off. So, um, and they're pretty feisty, but the, uh, the, the, the talons uh, are sharp and that's their weapon. The beak, you usually don't bite. So, you know, so as long as I, gra I grab the feet, they're fine, they calm down and they get real friendly. Kind of interesting, you know. So I would take them, send them down. We put the, we, you know, check them, put the transmitter on, and put them back in the nest. And uh, I've been doing that for quite a few years. So every year during nesting season, and like about in, in May. Here's a story of one. This, uh, you can kind of see the little backpack with the antenna here with the the transmitter. So it, when it fledged, it it flew all the way down to the Traverse Ranges, which is north of, of San Francisco. And, and I mean, north of Los Angeles. So a lot of times these will stay in the same area. So we're kind of like, what's up with this guy? Is going Hollywood or what? Well, then, then it turned around and went back up north to the same area where, where he was from. And then unfortunately he got hit by a windmill and broke his wing. And uh, they, could, they could tell by looking at the, uh, following the pattern that all of a sudden he wasn't moving. They went out to that location and, and found him on the ground Took him to the wildlife museum where he was, he was fixed up and cured, and eventually they were able to release him again. Wow! So yeah, the transmitter saved his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sure did. And that is that is a rare story. Sometimes a uh, the 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 volunteers got to him before anything else got to him, you know. But it, because you know, because there, there's coyotes and other stuff that'll get him when they're disabled. Okay, then I also studied bald eagles in Michigan. And uh, this is a study that's been going on since the 1960s. They, they, they take the, uh, the nestlings and take a blood sample and, and study it and test it for contaminants. And this is how they found out that the DDT is a problem and is, and is making the eggshells thin. So they measure the amount of DDT and they documented that they got DDT banned. So this was banned in, you know, early 1970s. It's still in the environment. You still find traces of it. And that's how long these chemicals stay. And now they find other problematic chemicals, certain fire retardants and stuff that build up. It's because the, uh, you know, if it's in the water, it gets concentrated in the fish. The birds eat the fish and they get in a higher level of concentration. So I would go climb to these nests or send down the nestlings. They could be any size, and then the biologist would take a blood sample, send them back up. Meanwhile, the uh, adult eagles, uh, sometimes they were around, especially if the nestlings were young, the bald eagles were around, and they would fly around or they watch me, but they never attacked me, amazingly enough. So even though I take, took their babies and put them in a bag, they just like forced me. So here's a couple of, of uh, nestlings by a field and you can see some of their prey material. And these are the typical nests. This is in a cottonwood. So the nests are big and they use the same nest every year and they keep expanding them. So they might be six feet across and six feet tall. And I'm trying to get around them and there's not much really stuff to tie into like in this case. So what I, I do sometimes see, I got my, uh, I got my pole there, I will, I will, Set my climbing rope, maybe set it two or three places even, so there's enough strength so I can pull myself up and get into the nest. 
Uh, that's a difficult climb there. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. It's a highly technical climb. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. sort of tree is that? This one is a, is a cottonwood. Mm. Is it? And, uh, and no. sometimes the, uh, a lot yeah. of the trees I climbed were, were white pines. They get pretty tall. Sometimes so, a, uh, a white pine sometimes will have a top higher than the nest that's strong, is easier to tie into, but other times there won't be anything, especially in the cottonwood. Right. So where, wh what was your first tying point here? <laughs> like, did you, sh did you like get a line right underneath like the nest or like much higher? No, like, my below, we, I, you know, so I think I had a line set here. here. Yeah, that's what I was the, wondering. Uh, so I, I always go up and, and, and then send another tie-in point up higher. I don't want to shoot a throw bag up and try to get it up here. I don't want to hit the baby bird in the head. Mm. Right. And that's why I advance I use this pole to advance the rope. You know, um, I, don't, I don't use the throw bag. I just set the rope exactly where I want it. So that's yeah. it pretty good. Oh, that's smart. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here is a Rachel that, uh, you know, I remember her from uh, Costa Rica. Hey, Rachel. <laughs> and uh, she's here with one of the birds, and here I'm with one of the little ones. So I also do these things. Like, I do facilitate group climbs. Sometimes we do them for birthday parties for kids or for, for whoever, you know. And, uh, um, you know, James has some connections that we'll do them for Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. And they're actually working on – the Girl Scouts are working on making a batch – for tree climbing, so they, they might need, need to consult with us for that. I mean, the, the Girl Scouts uh, organization has a badge for tree climbing. So Girl Scouts in the States can just basically go climbing with any kind of uh, person who is kind of following our guidelines. Um, or basically, I think they actually copied our guidelines, I think, in like the, oh, the Girl I Scout handbook. Anything. Did you know yeah. how long they had that? It's, it's They've like, had it for at least like two years, I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that might so. be, uh, they, they, I don't know if they, for what we did with a local Girl Scout went up the chain of command. That was, uh, it might have been part of that or it might have been different. Yeah, different maybe. Process. Yeah. So you can definitely advertise in your neighborhood like, hey, Girl Scouts, if you want to earn your tree climbing badge, then, you know, you can help. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right, cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's in their handbook. All right. <coughs> okay, so another uh, use I have for for um, tree climbing is when I do consulting. <coughs> like in this case, the uh, a big branch of a valley oak fell and smashed the roof. And you can see the break there and the damage. And then the question is, is this tree at risk of failure? Is the whole thing going to fall apart and create more damage? And I had to check it out and write a report. So I went up and drilled into the uh, the trunk with a, we call it a resistor graph. It has a very thin needle and it measures the resistance. So it'll tell us if there's decay, if there's a hollow, if there's solid wood. In this case, there was a lot of decay. So like right here, there's a big a chainsaw cut that was done probably 20 or 30 years ago. There's some other cuts like this on the other side. This is cut too close to the trunk. And there's a lot of decay. There's like cavities right here. And then what we found was there's a cavity inside the wood going straight up. And this is all hollow and they have a thin wall. So this tree was a, uh, this was just a high risk. And then we always look at the target and the, and then, and, and how often is the target there? Well, the house is going to be there 24 seven. So when it breaks, it's going to hit the house no matter what. So this is a recommended removal. So, do you believe that they caused the failure with that cut? Yes. Wow. Yes. I think I need to learn some better pruning because I'm probably cutting too close to the trunk. Yes, there's a there's a lot of work done on that. A, a flush cut creates a lot of decay because you because the uh, when you cut that close, you're actually creating a trunk wall. You're not just cutting cutting into branch wall. Since you enjoy books, Eric, are there any good resources um, that you can think of for proper maintenance? Uh, Al Shiko, do I have his books here? Maybe I have any other room, but but uh, the, the main researcher that uh, studied this and proved it, and he changed the, uh, the, 
that practices our board culture. His name is Alex Shiko, A S H I G O. Look for him. There's one called the New Tree Biology, and that's probably the best one. And there might be some articles. Um, as far as pruning, and not just how to make the cuts, but also, you know, what branches to cut and stuff. There's a guy from your area who is at the top of the line these days, Ed Gilman from University of Florida. He published a book called Tree Pruning, and uh, and he also has some videos online uh, posted by the University of Florida that are really good that talks about all that. And did you say Eric? Alex. Alex Shiko and oh. Ed Gilman. <laughs> so Alex Shiko is a guy that, that was did all the research. He did a lot of research in the 1950s and 60s, and his books came out in the early 80s. I went and studied with him in, in New Hampshire and, and before he passed away. He was a great guy, really smart, and knew a lot about different things. He would tie in, like, theory about trees to, to music, and, and he brought in you know, social theories, chemistry, you know, tied everything together. So it was, it was inspiring. And he's, uh, he's, he's considered this called, he's called the father of modern abort culture because back in time in the 1960s, they called it tree surgery. For example, if there was a, a cavity in a tree, they would go in there with tools and cut out all the discolored wood. And then they fill the cavity with concrete uh, and and Shiko proved that that is is worse than doing nothing because you're breaking all the natural barriers to decay, and you're creating you're sealing in moisture, and you, and you make things worse. So a lot of these practices have been changed. The people don't do it anymore unless a few people that not had not caught on yet. I didn't even know that was a thing. That's awesome. Uh, another question, that device that you're using, the resistance meter, um, in using that, do you test several sites? Is there like a, a proximity that you do? Yeah. So what I do is um, I look at it first and look at the shape of the trunk. I hit it with a hammer, with a, a wooden mallet or a plastic hammer. I listen and listen for cavities. And I decide where do I want to, where do I want to test to get the best best picture of what's going on. So it's always more than one drill. It's like <coughs> right here, I will get I will get a reading of the thickness of the wall. So I, I go in so far, it's sound, and then from there it's rotten. But then I want to know at other places up and down and around the circumference. Then I can make a drawing, I can make a have a pretty good picture of what's going on. So do you basically get a reading of like how strong it is? Like at, at each like point from like the bark into like the wood? Or yes, you get it, you get a graph. So uh, there's a there's a like it's just like like a little distance. needle like you would see like on yeah. a lie detector. Yeah. And that is actually <laughs> that's built in right here. Yeah. So so as it measures, as the needle goes up and down and it moves. You, you get a, a graph paper and you can look at that paper and it'll show you, oh. you know, in real time or in real, in the real distance. But you got you to sort of be experienced with it, know your species and, and uh, you know, really be able to read it and, and uh, explain it. Right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Never yeah. saw that. Uh -huh. It's yeah. a small wound. It's like a very, very tiny uh, drill bit. Yeah. So it, it's not very invasive, but it's still invasive. Right. So what material is that needle made of that it doesn't break? It's uh, it's just a uh, high uh, high quality steel. Okay, interesting. <laughs> very intrigued. Yeah, yeah. That is fascinating. Yeah, yeah I mean, invented and made in Germany, of course. Very technical. Of course. Of course. <laughs> it, it's very useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there are lots of forests in Germany, though, so not surprising. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, all right, so I also talk about another little tree climbing thing. I make these these uh, nesting holes. And uh, in this case, there was a Monterey Cypress. It started uprooting during storm. It was uprooting over the driveway to become a hazard. So I cut off the top. So then it stabilized. It's not going anywhere. And then I left it as a wildlife tree. I made a little cavity. You know, cut out a section, hollow it out, and put the section back in. 
and I and I know like what size cavity and what size entry hole to certain species of cavity nesting birds like. And sure enough, the next spring there's there's a bird living in there. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah, very nice. And uh, okay, so then I do these tree wolf tours and to Costa Rica, and Costa Rica is. Uh, yeah, I know it well now, and it's a um, it's a it's a very diverse country. Different elevations, and the Pacific side and the Caribbean side have different environments. It has a you know seasonal dry forest in the northwest and things. So there's a lot of things to look at. It has the volcanoes, a lot of, of the diversity and wildlife, and a lot of trees to climb. So this is a saber, a common name kapok. And these are the emergent trees in the forest. They shoot up till they're above all the other trees and then the canopy spreads out like that. In this case, the forest has been cleared and they left this, this is in a, in a farmer's watermelon field. And we got permission to climb it, you know, and the, uh, and the, the farmers came out and watched us and they, they bought us pineapple, you know, it's all cool, you know. I wish the farmers in California were like that when we wanted to, cut, we wanted to climb a tree there and they called the police. How tall is this tree? What's that? How tall is this tree? This tree is, this is a, I would say, uh, this might be about 110 feet to the very top. 130? Yeah, 110, something like that. That's just a guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I climbed a tree as well. It's like in this little farm and there's a little house with like, I think uh, the, 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 the person, the man of the house basically was sick for a while. Um, mm -hmm. There's this little bamboo stand behind it. Um, yeah, I, I won't say like it's at least 30 meters. So yeah, it's like at least like 100 feet. It's like definitely taller than that. Like I almost wanted to say it's closer to 45 meters, but that would be like 150 feet, I guess. So that might be too tall. What kind of tree was this again? Uh, it's called Saber. Saber. Sapa Pentantra, I believe. It's a uh, C E I B A. And uh, it's also Tyler? called paper. Does it have red flowers? Yes. And it has uh, it has these, these uh, fibrous threads that were used in the past to fill pillows and mattresses and uh, life vest. Okay. Yeah, so, so, yeah, and during the Second World War, they, you know, all the, all the Navy guys had a vest made with Cape Park. Right. So, are these the ones that you see in the forest and they stand out like during blooming season? Season, they're just full of red flowers. Yeah, yeah. So they. Okay, I they know. Go dormant. Okay. And they go dormant during the dry season, and when they when they oh. come back into life, they flower first before yeah. the leaves. That's why they're so spectacular. Yeah. So in in like um, and this say bad also like normally they have like um, these these weird kind of spines. Yeah. You know, it's like little little mountains with like a spike at the end. Right. Um, and so, and this one, I know that it had last probably because it's older. So it still has a lot of like on it, like on the branch, it's at, at the side kind of to protect itself. Um, I know it's that, but like, yeah. And in, in the, the genus Seba can kind of be found like, I think everywhere in Latin America at least. And uh, so we also have them in Argentina and they were called like Palo Borracho. Because the ones that we have in like uh, Argentina at least, I'm not sure if this one does it a lot, it's like this trunk and need where they store kind of, I guess there are a lot of moisture, I guess. And so they get like, uh, as they grow older, they, they grow like, they, they basically make these little bellies at the yeah, bottom. Exactly. So they really, you know, round yeah. at the bottom. So Palo Borracho basically means like drunk tree, yeah. you know? So, because that's what they look like. Like, you know, they, 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 they've just been ingesting like a lot of beer and now they're gonna get through the dry right. season. And it's also yeah. like they, um... The the wood um, the wood has, contains a lot of water. Like if you cut them, yeah. you, see, you got water running, and I mean that's why it's not it's not good wood for construction. No. It's just uh, it's just a lot of moisture. It's kind of like like a poplar or something. Yeah, but, they're uh, fun trees. Yeah. yeah, they're great trees, and they're yeah. in, in Brazil. They call them suma uma, and they're you know 
they are uh, like if you fly over the uh, fly over the Amazon in a small plane when they're flowering, it's amazing because you see you see the flowers here and there. Mm -hmm. In Puerto Rico, they have them in some areas uh, of the rainforest there, and when you see them blooming, mm -hmm. and the rainforest is red, it looks amazing. Right. Yeah. I know of a couple here in my area, you know, they, they are kind of not, not doing real well, but they actually managed to survive. There's one in my neighborhood and there's one in Fremont near there that's, you know, and, and there was one at a, uh, at a, at a local brewery that, uh, there, there was actually two of them. There was this place called Pyramid Brewery and they had good beer and they had two of these trees. And then Tesla bought, Tesla bought the company. And now it's a Tesla uh, service station. And they, the first thing I did was cut down these two trees. So that's how it goes. Uh, that's, why? Why? That's why? Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know why. It's just like, yeah. I was wondering if it's necessary. Like, you really should have, like, branches in governments that basically, like, don't, don't you guys have that? Where it's like, if you want to cut a tree, you actually need, like, a good reason, kind of? Or can you just, well, like, if it's your property, you can do whatever? Every city and sometimes county has their own ordinance. Right. And, and uh, Berkeley has a very poor ordinance. Berkeley is, a, uh, is generally a, a, a environmentally conscious and regulated city, but they have a very poor tree ordinance. All they have is you cannot cut down a coast live oak that's native to here because they decided they needed a tree ordinance back in the 1990s and the city council decided they couldn't agree on anything so they said well let's make a, a temporary moratorium on oak trees at least and then we'll work out the details mm -hmm. so they never worked out the details this is very contentious so sure. now it's, it's still yeah. like that people are surprised like like big redwoods you know in oakland you need a permit in berkeley you know you don't unbelievable yeah yeah there should really be blank laws for that, you know, for a lot of these things. Right, right. No, it's it's all by local ordinance. There's no, yeah. way, no state law. Yeah. Uh, okay, here. So here's another seabed. This is inside the forest, and we actually measure this one with a tape measure, and it's 174 feet, and uh, it has you know a lot of a lot of just trunk going straight up about the same diameter all the way to the top. And then uh, here is here's my friend Richard Mumford uh, at the base of it. And here are some of the climbers at the in the top. So that that's why that's why it has that characteristic structure. It gets up above the surrounding trees and then it spreads out. And this was actually during the dormant season. It doesn't have leaves on it. All the uh, all the greener you see are epiphytes. And uh, I'm looking at who's there. Who's there? See if there's anybody you might know from the climbing community. Well, there's Richard and uh, and Judy. Yeah. And, oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Richard and Judy and Daniel, Aaron. What's his name? I forget who these people are. So yeah. And there was a uh, there was a way back in the forest. We went in there on horseback. It was like a whole day trip to go to. It was in this area. Then down where we were staying, down by the beach. And this guy here, my friend Joseph, he's uh, sleeping in the canopy. And uh, he 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 part, part of the time he lives with this sequoias tribe in Ecuador that the canopy. Uh, camp out is, is supporting and he does the uh, he does the ayahuasca he's like an apprentice doing ayahuasca with the, with the shamans and stuff and uh, you know that's some powerful stuff you know I, I once one was enough for me but I admire it it's really it'll take you on a trip for sure I actually want to try that um... yeah I <laughs> I, I won't say I recommend it, but I say go for it. You know, and you find it's uh, it's the most powerful thing. So I was, you know, I'm 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 heavy generation. I tried a few drugs back in the day, and then I, you know, I had enough of that. But there was one thing that I never tried. I wanted to try, and now I try it. I don't want to try it again. But it it, it, definitely, it definitely throws you for a loop. It takes you on a mental journey. 
That's pretty Don't impressive that he's uh you said an apprentice. I heard that the the culture that that does that is traditionally very, you know, kind of standoffish. Yeah. Yeah, so he 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 managed to become friends with him and, and become part of it. You know, and he's just a nice guy, very helpful and 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 that's probably how they accepted him. And I just had I just had some email exchange where they might definitely want to go down there and see him. So this particular uh, hammock, he slept in it, and I then I slept in it a few nights, and we had that. I had a mosquito net on it, and then uh, I woke up one morning, and the mosquito net was all pulled to the side. But I had to get one bite. The mosquitoes are no big deal, and that. And that's Costa Rica is kind of like that, especially near the ocean. If that had been in the Amazon, I would have got a million bites. Yeah, that's an interesting hammock. That's a, a very special climate in a way. It's, it's that actually is a, a tree boat. Really? I think. Yeah, that's a tree boat. And they, oh, they, they sell them. They used to sell them with a specific uh, mosquito net that goes all the way around. Ah, that's why I wanted to say it's a tree boat. And I was like, no. But then like, because a tree boat is indeed like rectangular. Well, most normal hammocks you buy on Amazon are a typical hammock shape, right? So I was like, this is strange. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 yeah it's rectangular. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it has four time points. Right. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, that's really nice. I have a couple of them you know, for this weekend, and then I have the other cheap, lightweight one. You know, they work pretty good too, They're easier to travel with. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, had, I think we have, if we, if we take a good look, you can find 15 people in this tree. We had everybody up. There is uh, between. I get to 10. Oh. Okay, <laughs> I don't know. Five, six, it's seven, like seven, fine wall. Ten, uh, 12, 13. I got 14 now. Okay. <laughs> right, 15. Yeah, I think I found the last one. All uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so that, this was down by the ocean in, on the ocean peninsula. And this is up in the cloud forest at about 8,000 feet elevation up in the Talamanca Mountains. So they, they have some monster oaks up there. And yeah. here is my friends Vern and Petrina hanging out in the canopy. And as you see, there's a lot of, it's like a garden of mosses, epiphytes, orchids, bromeliads, all kinds of stuff growing up there. It's got, it's got that moisture from the rain and from the fog and just loves it. Uh, very comfortable. This bird here, this splendid kisal, this is a bird that we, when we visit that area, we always see it. It's beautiful. It has these long tail feathers and really shiny green colors. And it feeds on wild avocados. So when we go, we go to the trees where the wild avocados are ripe. We find them there. That's where they feed in the morning. Mm -hmm. So this is a Tree Climbers Rendezvous 2018. This is a whole group in the lodge there where we're staying up in the cloud forest. So there are no doubt some people you know, uh, let's see, where is Nadia? Good eye, uh, is Nadia in the middle on the bottom? Is that you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right here. In front of the orange. Right here. Well, that's Wiley, isn't it? I think. No, that's Nance. Who's that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, Wiley's right in the middle. Right? Lee's oh, like he... in the middle, kind of. Oh, yeah. Vi Wiley's right here. Yeah. Oh, that's why, yeah. Is Nick Orion, like, the right or Nick left, Ryan. right? Yeah. Wall Fuji. Ah, that's the guy. Is James in the back? Or no? James. No. James. Bowder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole crew, man. This is, a, this is a good time. It's a good group. That was an amazing trip, Eric. I'll never forget it. It was... Uh, I didn't get to tree climb much because really it was only a couple of days and we had such bad weather, it was raining, but right. overall, I mean, I, I still have to say that swimming with the whales was the most amazing thing. Oh, wasn't it though? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. But I would like to go back and climb some more of those trees because um, well, you'll see when you come and visit me in Florida, but I have a lot of bromeliads, I have probably 40 something varieties of bromeliads all over my property. 
and I do love them. And um, I remember, you know, when I climbed and I finally got up because the first time I attempted to climb, we got interrupted by a storm. So we had to come down. Mm -hmm. So the next day I climbed again, I finally got up pretty high on the tree. And as soon as I got to a big branch, it was just like you described, you know, it was full of mosses. And I mean, I looked around and, and there was almost nowhere I could sit and not not put my butt on something that I was damaging. Yes, yeah, so it was nice. for me. And I finally snuck in a little spot there and I just, I couldn't move. I couldn't keep climbing because I was so afraid of hurting the plants. But on the other hand, I was perfectly fine just sitting there for an hour and just taking in all the plants around me and this wild orchids and everything. It was like, I was in this aerial museum, you know, botanical garden up there in the air. And yeah, I, I don't know how you guys climb and move from place to place. And I, I guess you just think that, you know, the plants are resilient enough that if you knock out a few that they're going to be okay. And yeah, we, 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 I mean, we are as careful as we can be you know, and do a lot of damage. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's an amazing place just to hang out up there. Like I say, just be quiet and hang out for a while. And that's what I ended up doing. And I truly just enjoyed it. You know, usually I'm busy trying to do stuff, especially here in Florida. I'm always moving around. But over there, I was, I felt so humble and so tiny. And I just sat and I just listened and looked and watched the, the storm and the fog come in and the flowers around me I, I was just in total awe I mean I was almost like paralyzed in a way I remember that was my feeling there right yeah it's very beautiful so what was the location because I didn't go to that one was it mostly in the cloud forest in Costa Rica is that what was going on or did you yeah, have the rendezvous locations? the rendezvous was in the cloud forest okay that's why in, yeah. the, uh, in, in so you've been to Costa Rica yeah a couple of times and uh, so the the famous cloud forge where a lot of people go is Monteverdi, and that's mm -hmm. where N and Nellini did her research. Right. This is in the Talamanca Mountains. It's on the, the south, I would say. Yeah. And um, there is a valley, uh, it, 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 and there's this lot, Savega Lodge. It's a very nice area. There's a you know the cloud forest above the lodge, and and you know some mm -hmm. still streams and waterfalls. So I prefer to go there. Yeah. That's yeah. And so for like pre or post food activities, you didn't go to like Osa or you no know, the the forest on the other side of the continental divide. Uh, yeah, we did. We went to both oh, sides. So the okay. the pre trip went to the Osa and the post trip went to Totuguero. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. So okay. we covered a lot of territory. Right. Yeah. Just not a lot of tree climbing for Nadia, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> oh well, yeah, it was rainy. I mean, that's it, it was in August. Yeah, it was in August, yeah. So that's that's the rainy season. Yeah, but it was an amazing trip. I mean, if you look at it as we went to Costa Rica and saw Costa Rica, that's what the trip was about. It just happened to be for a couple of days. We did some tree climbing, you know. Right. Yeah. But we got turtles. We went and you know snorkeled, and we you know we just yeah, it was it was an amazing trip. Right. Makes sense. <laughs> and here's Donald Perry climbing a tree with my friend Walt Fuji, you know, the the original tree climbing biologist. And here is the, uh, that's the design we had made when uh, we had on our t-shirt that came out pretty good with it. This is a, uh, this is not to scale as they say, but this is supposed to be the Quetzal and here's the climber. Yeah, that was a nice logo. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so here's another canopy research adventure. This is called the Matra de Dias region in the Peruvian Amazon. And this is, a, uh, is, a, is an area that's remote and unexplored to a high degree. But right now it's under a lot of pressure from logging and gold mining. It's a shame. So my friend Andy is down there. He's with the Osa Conservation Corps. He always do some work down there. But this area is uh, 
any of you ever seen a movie called Fitzgeraldo by Werner Herzog? Okay, it's based on a, on a story that happened in that region back like uh, a little over 100 years ago. And there was a, uh, this was during the rubber boom where they, where they uh, you know, the Amazon had the monopoly of rubber and they started using it for a lot of things. So this one guy, he, he went up river and he went, there was one place he couldn't, he couldn't go with his boats because the rapids were so strong. And he bought, he, he bought a boat over a, a hill to get it to another river. And he went in there and, and collected rubber, tapped the rubber trees. So anyway, this, this crazy German Werner Herzog uh, made a movie based on that story. And it's kind of, it's kind of uh, not really like the true story. But anyway, that's the region. And in that region, there are so-called uncontacted people that live back in the forest. And, the, and then when you get, you get to the end of the road, you get to the river there, there's a sign saying, be careful, there's uncontacted people and they will shoot you if you, you know, and don't avoid them and don't do that. And the fact is that they're, the fact that they will shoot you is, is not, they were not, it's not real that they were uncontacted. They were contacted. They were, they were enslaved and killed during the rubber boom and they were, they were forced to collect rubber for the rubber tables. And they have a collective memory of that. So they don't want any outsiders. You know, they were contacted. They used to live along the river. Now they, they pulled back into the forest and they're still there. But now they're getting the pressure from the gold miners and loggers, a lot of things going on. It's kind of a shame. Uh, but there was quite an adventure. I mean, the way you get there, you go fly down to Cusco, which is up in the high Andes. You got to drive a whole day to get to a river. Then you go by boat. And I went to a research station where they had some some uh, motion detection cameras that were put up in the canopy, and they were supposed to send pictures, send images wirelessly to an antenna. They were supposed to send it to another antenna so you can download them, you can see what's going on. And it never really worked right. There were some problems with it. Uh, so they wanted me to find these cameras, bring them down to work on them. And they sort of told me they had an idea where they were, but they they kind of we wasn't that precise. It wasn't like coordinates or anything. So I had to go down there and find them, send them down. <laughs> With how did you find something like that? How many days? No, you... so so we, we we knew in general where they were. So we walked around with binoculars. You know, there's so much stuff. There's so many vines and. Uh, you know, bromelias and whatever. So we just carefully walk around with binocular and study the canopy. And all of a sudden we start screaming, there it is, there it is, we got it. Uh, they they climbed the so, tree. Did they not have a GPS coordinate or like something related to like a transect system to know no. where it was? Well, whatever they had was lost. There there was no, they had like a, a general description uh, and, uh, and that was it. That's something, yeah. you know. I mean, I don't know what happened. So, somebody was, That's crazy. somebody was hired to put those cameras there, and that person was not part of it anymore. It might have been a change of personnel or whatever. So, so that's where we ah, sort of okay. started, started from scratch. Right. Yeah. Because you normally, you normally know where you put your camera traps. I know. Right. right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so here I am going up and. Um, of one of the trees. So that little net came in handy again because there was a wasp nest they started building by one of the cameras. And there were also all these uh, sweat bees that would attack you. So, so the, the, the network for those two. Yeah. And there is Anne Dangerfield. You met her. She was a, did a talk at the Redwood Rendezvous. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, Madagascar Adventure. We did a ant and canopy boot camp. So we trained some graduate students in climbing, and then we went out in the forest to collect ants in the canopy. And those ants are little known. And every time they do that, they find species of ant that have never been described or named before. You know, I wanted to name some. I had kind of some good ideas for names, but they wouldn't. They said it's a very long and complicated and tedious process to name something, you have to go to research and literature and document it. Is that right, Greta? It's not, it's not even worth it, pretty much. Yeah, to name like a new species? 
Right. Yeah, and then sometimes there are like rules, like uh, I think nowadays often you can't name species after yourself, for example, anymore. So it's even like more work to kind of like figure out what like the actual name should be. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not easy to do. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of documentation and paperwork yeah. and bringing it to whatever organization yeah. or go yeah. to a conference. Yeah. Um, I love the graphic on that poster. That is that a very nice graphic. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. You can see he's got the ants up there on the canopy. I, <laughs> I don't know who did that. That's pretty cool. And I love the fact that they used a female climber. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's very yeah. nice. So this is a team, three males, one female. And uh, we need at least that. So if Anne cannot make it, Anne, Anne just got a job in Peru and uh, she's supposed to start there in January. Now we're supposed to go to Madagascar in, Jan in January. So I know what's going on. Maybe both things are canceled the way the world's looking. But I would love to go there with the same team again. We did this as a good group. Mm. So who pays for this? I would love to go there too, but not in January. <laughs> huh. Right. It, it, it seems like it's too soon, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like who, who pays for this? Because I know in the past when I talked to people, they basically said like, yeah, we, 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 like, we pay or I pay. Like, oh, that's not like contemplate that. It's a, uh, it's a federal grant. Mm. So then how do you pick the people that go with you? You know? Oh, um, they they sent an application to, so there was a, uh, Brian Fisher with the California Academy of Sciences uh -huh. and his partner, who's with the University of Carolina and now she's in Germany. So they, they review the application and they pick people. Mm. They had some excellent uh, people. I mean, it's just like, these are very young people, but they are like a Harvard and Yale graduates and have done research and all over the world and, and speak five languages. I was like crazy. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Like a bunch of geniuses, you know, so. But uh, right. at least they weren't too genius. They weren't so genius that they couldn't learn to climb. They, they climbed like this, so that's good. Right. And then we had a, uh, we had like 10 Americans and two Malagasy. And uh, next time, so this is something I talked to Brian about also. I said, we should have a better ratio. We should have, uh, and I think that was something with a grant. They, they limit what you could do and they wanted to go to America. But I think next time we're going to have a, a more Malagasy and fewer, you know, uh, Westerners coming in on the, on the team, which makes a lot of sense. And right. we, we camped in this uh, this little makeshift camp. These are the women from a village. They they have these little shelters. And this was a campsite. We would camp in, in hammocks. And then they would uh, they would cook for us. Um, what was the food like? What did they cook for you guys? Uh, rice and beans with every meal and a little bit of something. There was sometimes hard to tell what it was. Uh, you know, rice and beans and chicken or fish. Okay. Uh, yeah, three times a day, and uh, they was they felt us pretty good. I mean, they also they are they are pretty poor. They mm -hmm. don't have a lot, and uh, especially right now, like not so much. This is northern Madagascar. Southern Madagascar is in really bad shape. They have a famine right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they were great. And uh, the last night we were there, they had a little party for us, and they had put on a show and stuff. And so these are uh, some of the, the the young people from the on the village. They put on a traditional dance. And then this girl here, and uh, uh, and her friends, they are, you know, Carolini and, and Gabriela. They're Brazilian researchers, so they did a they did their dance. They did the macarena just to demonstrate something, and that went over pretty well. They were like the kids were like staring at him, like, "What the hell's going on here?" Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs>
So we had these uh, makeshift showers. So these guys would bring, they bring jugs of water and then they, they put it in a little tank and we used for to shower and they brought all these every day. Uh, this is a nearby village where they have little sheds by the road selling stuff to, to people that come by. And uh, this is, you know, nice people, the nice culture. It's a, the Mara Madagascar is a uh, has an endemic culture almost. It was, it was settled relatively late by people from Southeast Asia and from Africa. So it's a mixture as far as culture and religion and language of these two groups. And it has a very unique uh, culture and it has also of course the plants and animals. There's a lot of endemic plants. Uh, here is one of the students, you know, in this, we were, we were climbing to collect ants. So he's got this thing around his neck that's called a pooter. This is just a tube. You use that to suck up an ant and you put it in a little uh, container. Mm. And here's a big shot. So I, uh, now I, I carry these short, short poles so I can stick them in a bag. And the blue, the blue fiberglass is lighter than the typical yellow, but just as strong. Mm. So not too bad to travel with. There's a view from one of the trees. You can just see the uh, the pays of life over there, the ox, uh, ox cars and the rice fields. And a couple of baobabs. These are baobabs are uh, dormant during the dry season. And we climbed them. We spend the day just getting everybody up in them. Here is some of the people, local people, and one of the researchers going out. A view from one of them. These are the emergent trees. Uh, one of the local guys going down. Uh, so the yeah. lemurs, yeah, the uh, the lemurs are amazing. They're like about a hundred different species, and uh, you know they are something else. This one makes a makes a funny funny sound. We find it by the sound that go in the forest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, up to not too long ago, they thought there were only thirty species. But, you know, with DNA and more research, yeah, all of a sudden that number went up to 100. Like, oh, oh, yeah, what? yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so they knew what they were, but they, they divided it into more species? Yeah, they divided it into more species based on genetics, but also just based on, like, uh, observations of behavior and the fact that they have different vocalizations or perhaps live in, like, different social groups. Right. Just really more specific things. But, yeah, basically in the 90s, early 2000s, people just thought, like, there are 30 species of lemurs and that's it. No. <laughs> the, one, the iconic species that, that you, you see a lot of the picture of Madagascar is the, the ringtail lemur. Yeah. And, the, and that one I saw in the zoo in the city. And we actually, we stayed at the zoo and we did climbing training in the zoo. Right. Uh, so, yeah, and, that's cool. uh, so that was actually, that's pretty cool. And yeah. uh, some, of the, some of the Madagascar people that went to the zoo and they started watching us climbing instead of the animals. It was so fascinating. That's awesome. Uh, you know the um, <laughs> Eric. You know you are an animal, so yeah, I guess so. <laughs> just a different kind. <laughs> it's different kind, yeah. Yeah, the ring, the ring-tailed lemur is like it's really interesting because they're quite terrestrial and because they're so prevalent and kind of you know yeah, the movie Madagascar. So in like our minds in the states in Europe, we all think that like the ring-tailed lemur is everywhere. So people actually studying the ring-tailed lemur had like a really hard time to like make even scientists understand like, no, this species is highly endangered. You have to put it on like the most endangered primates list. So mm -hmm. it took them like a very long time. And then they were first quoted in in like 2016 is when they were first able to like convince scientists like, no, ring-tailed lemur is actually really endangered. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, but because of just our like view of wrinkled lemurs being all over Madagascar, you know, in every movie, it's, you know, they're always yeah, there. Yeah, no, not at all. They're you know? like in the in the southwestern yeah. part, and, and the, yeah, uh, yeah, and that, that part. I never. I went to the. We went to the central part in the highlands where the capital is, and we went, we went north. Right. If we go back. We'll go south. Maybe we'll get to see him in the wild. But yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, unbelievable. So uh, this is one of the guys I trained to climb on the researchers. And uh, he, uh, we, we had all our students train other people to climb when we got back into the city. This is in the zoo in the capital called Antanariva. 
And this is one of the students. She's a biology student. Actually, those two joined us in the virtual rendezvous at the at some of the sessions. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, maybe I'll get to see him again. That would be sad, yeah. So here we go. The in 2019 rendezvous of Redwood River Resort, we have the group. We have the Reynolds tree. It has a big, huge dark lake way up. You know, there's a lot of structure. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. And then, of course, last year we had the virtual rendezvous. And this is what we're going to have next. <laughs> there we go. You know all about that. I, I love that logo. That logo. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, you know, we we thought about trying to get somebody climbing the tree because that's kind of typical. But right. Our live oaks are so short that there was like, it just didn't look right, no matter what we did. Mm -hmm. And we did we drop the idea of having somebody climbing, and instead it's like let's just have the water that has have blue on the bottom. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a unique thing because we wanted to feature the springs and the live oak. So, yeah, it's nice. slightly different. So how tall are the live oaks? Yeah. Oh, you know, beautiful. When, when they're fighting for light, you, you will get them to climb about 80 feet, and that is as tall as they get, period. Um, but if they have an open field, and they can grow horizontally, they really don't get to 80 feet. They just grow more horizontally. Mm. So they're not very yeah. tall, but I think their structure makes up for the, you know, lack of height. Right. So right. I mean, I mean, 80 feet, that's pretty still tall. tall. Yeah. yeah. That's but pretty tall. Most of them don't go 80. Okay. You, you see them mostly going to about 60, but you know, they're wider than they're taller. Right. Still tall though, but I mean, taller than I expected perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Are these the same oaks as in Georgia, as the, the, the uh, Georgia rendezvous? You know, I, I'll have to ask an actual arborist because I hear a lot of people calling them Florida live oaks. Mm. And in Georgia, they tend to be taller and the structure is different. Over here, they're more like your Louisiana oaks where um, they get right. very horizontal with those very long, long branches coming out. Um, but some of them grow very symmetrical. Uh, the truth is they're all over the place in how they look. But when you think of a traditional Florida live oak, you think of a fairly short oak to about 60 feet mm -hmm. and branches that might go 80 feet to a size, you know, just, they just have a different look. Mm. Now we should figure that out. <laughs> the one area that we've been clearing has a hodgepodge of different shapes. They have from pretty massive bottoms to very symmetrical openings to some areas just have a whole bunch of like single ones growing and making almost like a, like a grove of single trunks. Um, so yeah, I need to get an arborist in, there, in that place to really look at it because I have lots of questions, mm. but he's been so busy and he has not been able to join us. But I do have a lot of questions about how come in this one area where obviously some of these are the same age, why are they so different uh, in shapes, you know? Um, then I also don't know how to age them. I know that the only way to age a tree is to cut it yeah. and the rings, but people- You can pour should... them <laughs> before cutting them. <laughs> <laughs> people can depending on the species you can get people to give you kind of a fairly good estimate you know if they know what they're doing and uh you know the thing is a lot of these oaks in this area have access to the aquifer so i mean if, if they have rich soil and water they grow faster and bigger mm -hmm. also you know 
So, yeah, I still have a lot to learn about them. I'm just keep hoping that John's going to be able to meet us and, and educate us, you know, um, definitely before the event. So, yeah, I want to say you want to get it done because, or you want him to be there because if not, you have all these tree climbers coming in. They have tons of questions. <laughs> You're just like, I don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. We'll get there. We still have a few months. Right. All right. So ready for the camping coming up soon? Yep. Yeah. All right. I'm going to stop screen sharing.